You can stand with us. We're just gonna bring ourselves to Jesus today, bring our hearts to Him, our weeks to Him, our days to Him. And, um, and yeah, just lay it all before Him in worship this morning.
You've done. 
sing we're falling in we're falling into deeper waters calling out after who after you jesus oh and we're Falling into deeper waters, holding after you. We're walking into deeper waters, going after you. Left, then we're going to the left, and if he goes to the right. 
right Then we're going to the right We're gonna dance, 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 dance in the river Dance, 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 dance Everybody, if he goes to the left Then we're going to the left And if he goes to the right Then we're going to the right We're gonna shout, 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 shout in the river Shout, 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 shout Say it again, if he goes to the left Then we're going to the left And if he goes to the right I wanna see you moving, Cole <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. It looked like about half of you guys were dancing for that, but that's okay. Brad, were you dancing? Were you going to the left and to the right? Awesome, okay. We're gonna actually, let's stay standing. We're gonna roll in some coffee and some donuts, and we're gonna have a little extended meet and greet. So for about five minutes, we're just gonna put on some fun music. There we go. We got the coffee and we actually have some kids that are going to serve you the donuts. Adults, only one tembet a piece. We can't have anyone overloading on these uh, tembets. Couple quick announcements um, as we're doing this. The nursery is open uh, the entire service. We have the live stream running in there. So if you want to just, uh, if you need to take your kid back there, uh, you can just stay with them. Junior Kids City, ages 2 to 4, everybody say 2 to 4, is open every single Sunday. So if you have a kid 2 to 4, you can take them back there in this 5-minute kind of coffee house time. And then Kids City, we're keeping the kids in here. We're going to have a couple little uh, fun things that we're doing with them, one of them being Timbits. Okay, come grab some coffee if you haven't. Say hello to a friend if you haven't. Come grab some Timbits if you haven't.
Something sacred about fellowship, don't you think? Didn't that feel good? Just to find a few people and kind of just kind of catch up a little bit? Um, I always think we just don't do enough of that on Sunday morning. Obviously, fellowship has to extend beyond the gathering on Sunday because we just don't usually have enough time for that. But that was super good just to kind of connect. Um, maybe you met a few new people. Isn't that good? Come on, turn to the person beside you and say, this is the place to be. Yeah, come on. And if you're on, if you're on the live stream, and I know there's a bunch of you on the live stream, you guys are in a good place too. And um, we're glad you're there. And it's a good day to be alive. Come on. It's a good day to be alive. I want to finish, I want to finish, not finish up. I realized I'm not going to finish it up as we were worshiping today. A, th- a topic that we, kind of, that we kind of jetted into last week really briefly. Wasn't last week just a party in here? If you were here, come on, or maybe you were on live, st- live stream. And uh, we just got to watch people get baptized. We got to hear some crazy stories of what God is doing. And uh, make no mistake, you guys, come on. God is doing things in this day, in this, this season that we're in, and we celebrate that. Okay, so let me just make a couple quick, I know Jimmy already made a couple quick mentions. Yeah, there is, we're not, no Kids City today, but we do have the, the, the two to four class. So if, you're, if, you, if there's any kids in the room or parents in the room that have ages, kids ages two to four, there is something going on back through that hallway, go, go down the uh, hallway, take a right, and you'll find it down there. And, um, and so a couple things really quickly by way of, of just announcement, and then I want Tiana to, to kind of get ready here on the, on the keyboard too. Are you ready to do this, Tiana? No. Do you have Caius? Let's get, and Ember's going to come in a minute. Ember, you can just sit tight there for a second. Is Caius around? Yeah, you guys, are gonna, you guys are in for a real treat here. Um, my my uh, grandson, Caius, is a, is, you didn't know this, but he's an accomplished piano player, and you're going to get to hear him. He's a, he's a wonder kind, a child prodigy. Just wait for it, okay? It's coming. I want to finish up a talk that I, we kind of got into last week. I'm going to actually break it into two parts, so we're going to finish it up next week. But a couple of things really quickly by way of just a couple announcements just to kind of keep you in the loop of some of the things that are happening. If you signed up for the, the Mentoring Discipleship Test Drive and you're wondering when you're going to get an email, you're going to get an email this week that's going to give you some time slots and we're going to start to form those together for the Discipleship Test Drive. If you're in the room and you're like, what is the Discipleship Test Drive? It's, um, it's something that really has become a huge part of what we do at Evangel where we journey together. Not yet, Caius, not yet. He's just so eager. He's been practicing all week. Where... We journey together in clusters of about 10 to 12, and we learn what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to walk with God. That's what the test drive is all about, to test that out over four weeks. So you can easily sign up to see one of the QR codes if you're still interested. This is not an opportunity that, that's going to end. It's going to be available before you all year. So if you're in a season right now, you're like, that just doesn't fit my calendar, my schedule, then that's totally fine. It, maybe it will in, in a month, or maybe it will in the new year. So that's totally Cool, but you can just check the QR codes around the building. Um, Secondly, uh, I wanted to give you guys just uh, just an update on Ron Riedel. So Ron Riedel is a part of our community. Ron is at home right now watching the live stream and has been battling ALS for the last 11 years. He has outlasted every prediction of how long he would live. And, um, and so, Ron, we just want you, you to know that we're praying for you, and this house is standing with you. And I wanted to give you guys an update that it has been, the last two or three weeks have been very difficult. And um, among other things, Ron experienced a heart attack, has, has organs are in not good shape. And so I know a lot of us have been praying for him, and this is a time to dig in. You know what? We still, we still believe that God can work a miracle of healing in his body. And so we're praying to that end. And uh, we're just speaking life and hope over him. So we just want you to know that too, Ron, as you're listening this morning, that we're speaking life over you. And we're believing um, that God's still working in this crazy season that you're in. Okay, so that's just a bit of an update. And uh, I wanted to do that. If you're new this morning with us at Evangel, then we want, you, we want to just give you a mug, one of these guys right here. So you can go to the coffee bar after the service. And um, we'll, we'd love to meet you and, and give you one of these epic mugs. You should always be using your evangel mugs, everybody. Come on. And if you don't have one, ask yourself why you don't have one. 
And if you're saying, nobody offered me one, ask and you shall. Mm. Pay and you shall find. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) It all depends on how much we like you, I guess, in terms of the price for the (laughs) Okay, um, okay, this is going to be good. Okay, let me just, a couple verses really quick. I want to say this, the greatest gift you could ever develop in your life through Christ is talked about in this passage, Hebrews 10, verse 19 to 24. I'm going to read it. And, and, and the Hebrews writer says this, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Isn't that a crazy statement? We can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, here it is again, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way Is that up there? It is. He opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And it's going to go on. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, that's Jesus, listen to this again. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. This is, is unpacking the gift that we have through Jesus, that we can actually, here it is, enter boldly into heaven's most holy place, we can enter this new and life-giving way that Jesus has made possible for us. We can go right into the very presence of God. This is the biggest gift afforded you and me because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, that we can actually come boldly before the throne of grace. We can actually walk with God in intimate relationship. It's insane. Now, if you've been in church all your life, you're like, well, of course, this is kind of the way it goes. But let me tell you, This is a great, great mystery that we unpack day by day in our lives, that we actually get to walk with the God of the universe in a friendship, okay? And then in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24, you'll recognize this passage. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, right? Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Why would the wise man be able to boast in his wisdom? Why would he boast in his wisdom? Because he's acquired wisdom, right? Right? He boasts in it because he's made some achievement in wisdom. Maybe he's gone to school. Levi was up here um, this morning on the guitar, and Levi could boast in his wisdom because he's been studying Hebrew and Greek at Bible school, right? But the scripture says, not let Levi boast in his wisdom. And then it goes on to say, let not the mighty man boast in his might. So Jimmy, who likes to work out, (laughs) Pastor Jimmy, who likes to work out, and, and, and gets to the gym and benches like 400 pounds. Is it 400 pounds that you're benching now? Something like that? Yeah, Ian's laughing. No. Because <laughs> he, he, they see each other in the gym. Um, and, and why would Jimmy be able to boast about his might? Well, because he's been working hard, right? And he's had some achievement there because of his hard work and his discipline and his routine. He's very disciplined in his working out. So he, could be, he should rightfully be able to boast in his accomplishments there. But the scripture says, let not Jimmy boast in his might. It goes on to say, let not the rich man boast in his riches. Who do I want to pick on here now? <laughs> Why would the rich man be able to boast in his riches? Because he has, he has worked hard, or she has worked hard, and has, and has done the right things along life, made the right decisions, and so has acquired material wealth and possessions and things like that. So they naturally would want to be proud of that, right? But the scriptures say, let not the rich man boast in his riches. Here's what it ends with. But let him who boasts, boast in this. You ready? So if you're a proud person and you're a boasting type of person, Apparently, that's okay in this context. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he knows me, says the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Don't boast in your riches, don't boast in your strength, don't boast in your wisdom, but you you, you want to aim to be able to boast in this, that you know me and understand me. That's what the Lord is saying. Boast about this. And I, I would put to you that it works the same as all the other things. The rich man can boast in his riches because he has been disciplined in that area of his life. The mighty man can boast in his might because he has been disciplined in that area of his life and he's had a level of achievement. The, 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 uh, the wise man 
can boast in the, his wisdom because he's been working hard at that. And he has something to boast about, right, Levi? He's, when Levi, ever Levi's home, he's here for Thanksgiving with his wife, Jen. I just find Levi just walks around with Hebrew textbooks and he's like boasting in that all the time. And I, and I think, no, he's not. He's not super proud, just a little bit. And uh, because he knows more Hebrew and Greek than I do, for real, um, I always have to bring him down and run and say, well, oh, I don't know what I say. What do I say? It's not important. I always, I'm like, Hebrew doesn't matter. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. Do I say that? I don't say Hebrew doesn't matter. Um, but Levi, Levi has a right to be proud of that because he's been a, a phenomenal student and has pushed in and learned. But the scripture is saying, don't boast in that. Boast in this that you know me. And I, I want to say this. The person who, who is going to boast in that will have done the hard work before they can boast in that. Just like it works with might, just like it works with wisdom, just like it works with strength. And the scriptures actually invite us into this. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verse, uh, the whole passage of 12, and this is where Caius is going to come in. Is Caius back there? Oh, he got bored? Okay. He's like, why isn't there a real fire here in this fireplace? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, I'll read a couple verses really quick. And, um, and then I'm just going to rattle through some points and end with a question. Hebrews chapter 12 says in verse 11, For at the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we get this, uh, this idea that to be a disciple of Jesus actually means to enter into discipline. Right? Come on, is anybody with me? A disciple actually means you're, you're disciplined. If you're going to come to the point where you can boast in the fact that you know God, it will require a level of discipline on your part. And that's not just the works mentality. That's not discounting at all the work of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But it is part of the picture. And so Hebrews, the Hebrews writer is saying, it's going to be a disciplined journey if you're going to move in and experience all the things that God has for you. So it's like, here it is. Trained by, trained by the fruits of righteousness, pushing into discipline, even at this point that sometimes it's painful. Now, a lot of people have read this passage and thought that it's God that's always disciplining us. But if you look at the whole passage, this is not about God coming and browbeating you and pushing you and making things difficult for you so that you push into a certain direction. If you look at the whole passage of Hebrews chapter 12, you realize that actually what Hebrews 12 is inviting us into, what discipline means, is actually self-discipline. It's where you begin to lead yourself. And so there's verses like this in Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so what we're doing is we are engaged in the process of what it means to be disciplined and a disciple. We're laying aside weights that hinder and we're running clearly the path that's laid out for us. At the very end, uh, or a little later on in verse 14, it says this, another self-discipline piece. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And there's this invitation to push and to strive and to actually be self-disciplined. All discipline from God is intended to lead you to the place where you can be self-disciplined. I'll talk more about that later. Okay. You're all looking at me with like blank looks on your faces. So you're like, what does he mean by that? Any time that you undergo discipline from God, his intention is to get you to the place where you can be self-disciplined in life. Always. Discipline, what it means to be a disciple is to be disciplined always means self-discipline, and self-discipline always manifests itself as routine. And um, as it, 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 every time you repeat the routine, you become that thing. You're transformed into that thing that you're aiming for. It works with might. It works with riches, it works with wisdom, and it works with your relationship with God. Discipline equals self-discipline, always equals some kind of routine, which, when repeated, leads to transformation. <laughs> do I have, do I what I have to do to get, like, you guys, okay, I'll do it then. I'll do it. Okay, so let's, let's have Kai set the piano here. I want to just, uh, I want to just show you Kai's his great skill. This is uh, Tiana, is Kai's mother. He's going to let him set up the keyboard first. Okay. He's just got to get the buttons right. Okay, here we go. Okay, Kai's, can you play us like a song? He's like, I got to get the pads on right and stuff. You can see him, he's working at the buttons and stuff. He's very experienced with this. Oh, did you hear that? 
Is that fluke? Okay. He's got one thing on his mind. Okay, Caius is an example of Christians that don't have discipline. (laughs) I know this is going to come as a big surprise to you, but he doesn't practice a lot. He is, a, he, but he is an aspiring pianist. He has big dreams and big visions. But it doesn't ever translate into the fact that to be a disciple of anything, including piano, like, and Caius, I, I don't, I'm not meaning to preach at you here. I hope you don't feel bad about this. Um, maybe a little conviction would be good. He's also aspiring to be a singer. Is that for him to go from his dream of being a piano player to experiencing the realization of that is going to involve a process. And it will probably start with discipline. And by that I mean his mother will discipline him. Um, okay. Yeah, he's still working at it. Tian will discipline him to the, to the, to, with the end goal of him learning to be self-disciplined with the routine. What does the routine look like, Tiana? Maybe we should pull Ember up here. Should we pull Ember up? Come on, let's give it up for Ember. Yeah, come on, let's give it up for Ember. Papa's super proud of Ember because she is becoming a piano player. And Ember also has a vision, and it, it's, it's actually turning into discipline now. And so, Ember, Ember can you just tell us like, what, you, what you have to do every day? Like, what's your discipline or your routine? What do you do every day to learn to be a piano player? What do you do? Practice. How long do you practice? Like 10 minutes? 10 minutes a day? 10 minutes a day practice? And when, when she practices, she practices the pieces that she's working on. Auntie Mary is her teacher. Where, wherever Auntie Mary is, she's somewhere around here. Okay, Ember, how long have you been playing piano for? You're just being so shy. Two, is it two months? One month. Okay, let's see what discipline has turned up in one month. Okay, go for it. Amber, let's hear your, let's hear your piece. Are you going to play it? Is it a Christmas piece or is it like she's preparing a Christmas song? Come on. Thank you, Ember. Thank you, Ember. Ember, you can, you can sit down if you want. Papa's done torturing you. I had to promise to, actually, I was thinking dollar store, and then Mimi's like, we'll take you to Winners, we'll buy you anything. I'm like, <laughs> So now I'm interceding. I'm interceding that, that anything is like, no, not good for me. This is, I'm a victim here. Um, so this is a, th- th- I want you to kind of see what, what's happening. And, and th- the scriptures actually teach about your walk with God. This, it actually puts it together with what it would take to, be, to grow in wisdom, or what it would take to grow strong, or what it would take to grow in wealth and possessions. And it's basically, it's basically implying in Je- Jeremiah, 29, or Jer- Jeremiah 9, verse 23 to 24, that it works kind of the same in your walk with God. Discipline should lead to self-discipline and routine, and when the routine is repeated enough, then you become, you manifest that thing which you're pursuing. It works that way with music, it works that way with writing, it works that way with business, it works that way with your marriage. In any area of life that you're looking for transformation and you want to pursue a dream, something that God has given you, then this is how it works. Discipline, at, at, the, at the beginning, you'll be forced, right? And so Ember still is probably, hey, Tiana is being forced a little bit. No, she is. Wow. I prophesy that you're going to have to force her at some point. <laughs> on the journey. I, I also took piano, well, well, so I did this, I've, oh man, I was forced to take piano lessons. Did you ever feel forced to take piano lessons? That, that ever seem? I remember feeling forced, oh, it's not on, when dad was my teacher, and I remember crying at the piano. <laughs> 
<laughs> I will readily admit this was not my gift. Um, I would turn. Well, no, I, no, you you were a very good teacher. I was just super oh, no. sensitive. Oh no, yeah, no, it's okay. I can take it. Um, I remember talking to mom, and I'd be like, "I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Every time I just start teaching her, she's crying." And, but not just you. Luke would cry, and Jordan would cry, and everybody, <laughs> Dave would cry. And it was just like, "What am I doing?" It just. <laughs> Um, so, any discipline in life. But I want you to see that this is how it works in your relationship with God, too. What keeps a lot of believers from moving into a place of maturity and life to the full and a sense of sitting in in an easy way into their calling, and I want you to see that your calling, I know a lot of us think of calling as some kind of ministry or some kind of dream to pursue, but your ultimate calling, listen to this, your ultimate calling in Christ is to walk with God. If you want to know what your calling is, that's it. Your calling is to walk in the Spirit. Your calling is to walk in step with the Creator of the universe. Listen to me. When that happens, when that comes into place, don't worry, everything else will. I remember my mentor saying to me uh, a, number, a number of years ago, he's like, if I can get you to abide in Jesus and walk with Him, everything else is going to take care of itself. Because he has a way of leading you very well when you're letting him lead you. But it works the same in that discipline. In fact, the song, uh, Deep Cries Out to Deep, that we just sang, comes out of Psalm 42, verse 7. And, I have, and I've thought of that idea that deep cries out to deep. And I, it's kind of a mysterious thing, even as we look at it in Psalm 40, 42. We're kind of like, what does that actually mean? I think partly this is what it means. If you're going to walk into the deep places of God that he has for you to go in relationship with him in the spirit, then it's going to come from a very deep place in you. And so the deep place in you is going to cry out in a sense and, and, and reverberate with the deep places of God. And that deep place, guess what? Guess what that deep place is? It's the disciplines of life. And in Psalm 42, in particular, the, psalm, the psalmist is going through a really difficult time. He's going through a really difficult season. It's the raise the hallelujah in the middle of the mystery when there's enemies all around. He's going through a really deep time. And there's no deeper place to walk the disciplines of the Christian walk than when you're not feeling like it. I mean, I mean that's a whole preach, and I'll touch on that next week. So Tiana, when, she, when she's going to, I'm going to have Tiana play here in a second. And I did have to kind of, I didn't, I had to bribe you too, actually. I just remembered. It's a sushi date. No, it's a sushi date for Tiana, not a family sushi thing. Um, let's, come, let's not go crazy here. You now, now you know the secret. If I ever ask you to do anything in Evangel, now you know the secret. Bribery. Just be like, well, let's make a deal. <laughs> right. You didn't know that. It's a secret to uh, all that. Thing. Anyways, whatever. Okay, I shouldn't have said that. Somebody's going to get ideas in the room. Okay. But Tiana's going to illustrate the, the discipline of the piano player, the pianist, and how she is transformed into that. But the journey has been one of lots of self-discipline and lots of routine, would you say, Tiana? How much routine? How much were you practicing in the final, the final season, swinging into grade 10? The final, the final season of my piano practice was I was supposed to practice six hours a day. I didn't necessarily practice six hours a day, but that was what my goal was that I would try to reach. And she was pregnant with Ari at the time, yeah, which made it even more interesting. Yet. Which is why I didn't practice six hours a day. <laughs> well, maybe I would practice four hours a day. I remember thinking it was a good day if I would practice four hours a day. Four hours a day to reach the goal of, of grade 10. Okay, so show us what this looks like. So I am out of practice right now, so disclaimer. <laughs> I haven't played these songs in a while. <laughs> Come on, Tiana. Okay. Okay, just take a deep breath. This is a grand piano. Yes. Okay. <laughs>
Yes, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make one point, okay? And I'm not going to slay. But I, but I think that when I heard you say that, one thing is really important here. I mean, there's lots of things that are really important. But this, is, this was part of my journey when it came to the piano, and I think it's legitimate. So I was learning the discipline of a piano player early on, and I was totally forced into it. Sometimes this is how God will do it in your life as well, okay? Have you ever felt like God is corralling you in a certain direction? Anybody ever felt like that before? Or have you ever felt like circumstances have come in to block your way so that you're forced to go this way and not that way? Have you ever gone through a door and as you're going through the door, it slams shut? Come on. And, um, and somehow you know that this isn't just evil at work in your life. <laughs> Somehow you know this isn't just evil, demonic attack. Somehow you know God is behind this. That is one way to experience discipleship. And I think God loves us enough that he will actually do this in our lives. He actually wants you to walk with him enough that he will actually orchestrate things, difficult things, even painful things, to get you moving in a certain direction. And I knew that playing piano. I had a, a teacher, she was, she was about 70 years old at the time. This is in Bella Coola. She had a big, big, mean cat. I remember that. And she would just sit down. I'd sit beside her, and she, and she had this particular smell. God rest her soul. <laughs> it's in my mind permanently. And, uh, and every week, she would just force me into these rhythms. And it wasn't fun. And then I'd go home, and my mom would be like, you have to practice, you have to practice. And it was not fun to do the scales and all these things. My, my oldest son, Luke, was in a, was in a, was in an, had an instructor, a beautiful lady that just poured into his life. She would make him do push-ups if he came not practiced up. <laughs> what does that have to do with piano? Nothing. <laughs> but get down on the floor and do push-ups. You didn't practice enough this week. And, and sometimes God will do the same, thing, same things in our lives. In fact, in an, at, a, at the beginning stages of our walk with God, often this is the case. Just like it'll be the case with Tiana and Ember at certain times, and certainly with Caius at certain times, if he decides to play piano, sometimes she'll come along with a bit of a heavier hand and direct and guide. The intent is always to move you to self-discipline. Always. Always, always, always. I believe this. When God brings discipline in your life, his ideal is that you learn to follow of your own accord. He doesn't want to go off chasing you. Think of the parable of the, of the 99 and the one sheep. And the 99 are in the fold. And yes, God does go after the one who has wandered off. But that is not his ideal. His ideal is that you're part of the flock and you're following him of your own volition. That's, I, that's what it means intrinsically to be a Christian, is to follow the shepherd. He doesn't drive us, right? That's not his style to come up and drive you, right? But he will sometimes drive you. How many can testify to that? Raise a hand. Oh, you poor souls that are being honest. <laughs> he will. It's uh, something we actually are thankful for, to be honest. I'm thankful for those times. There was a point in my life where God led Sarah and I into, the, when it came to us stepping into being, being pastors of a church, it was not an easy push. We actually needed him at that point to drive us. And the way I would describe it is I was like a little eaglet or a little turkey if you want. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Whatever. I was a little eaglet on the side of the nest, and I did not want to step out and fly. And God came into my life like the big, big old papa eagle and just went, Boo! and I tumbled out of the nest, <laughs> not able to fly, and discovered that I actually could, but I needed him to do that in my life. Okay, but the ideal is not that. The ideal is when I make the choice. You know this as a parent. When you force your kids to do chores, how helpful is it? It's not super helpful, right? I mean, it is, it's necessary and it's needed and you need to do that. Parents in the room. Um, your kids need guidelines. They need you to, to show them where the, where the boundaries are. But what's ideal and what's way more beautiful for them and actually grows their character more is when they actually choose to do their chores. And you know this as a kid. When you crossed over from that boundary of being forced 
to take responsibility than taking responsibility for yourself, that was the gold. That's where your character got shifted, that's where you matured, and that's the same way it works in your walk with God. Here's a little secret to entering into self-discipline. Get desire first. If you have a desire for that future, it will help you stay the course. And so I was forced to play piano. I hated it. I actually backed out in grade six, so I didn't go near as far as Tiana did. I started playing bass guitar in church at that point. I really had no interest in the piano. My dad invited a speaker, a special speaker. His name was Reggie Jackson. No word of a lie. Not the baseball player. Is it Reggie Jackson, the baseball player? Yeah, Yeah, not the baseball player. This big black guy from New York. I don't know how my dad connected with him, but he came and preached a few weekends over the years that we were in Bellacula. And so one year when he came, he brought, he brought a, an Italian guy named Nick. I've never told this story before. Nick had frizzy hair like Logan's would be if it grew out. <laughs> and Jimmy's would be if it would. You don't know most about Jimmy either, but if he grew his hair, it would just be like, boom. It would be like, where's Anthony? Anthony, are you back there? Okay, I'm talking to Anthony. He's in the live stream room. Just like curly hair. And this was Nick. And um, he was an Italian, he just had the Ita- he had, but he had the New York kind of accent and loved hot dogs and stuff like New Yorkers, <laughs> whatever. I, I'm really stereotyping New Yorkers with that. But, um, and Nick came along with Reggie Jackson one year to be his piano player. And Nick brought, if anybody knows keyboards, an old DX7, Yamaha DX7. And he played organ and he played jazz. Nick was the best jazz pianist I'd ever heard up to that point. And I'll never forget him up on, the key, up on the keyboard, and Reggie would say something kind of like, come on, you know, whatever he would do. And, and Nick would be like, dun, 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 dun. like a jazz scale. And I was sitting on the front. <laughs> okay, I'll show you one little thing I learned from Nick. I'll show you one little thing I learned from Nick. Oh. Um, what did I learn from Nick? Okay, so this would be like, um, this, this is the one thing I learned from Nick. Like something like that, just really simple. Just like kind of like, I mean, that's not super jazzy, but that was something he did. And I, I, I just remember, yeah, I don't have to clap. That was not that great. Um, that was really simple. If anybody wants lessons, I'll teach you. You'll cry, but I'll teach you. And, and Nick got up there and he started doing jazz and he started adding these crazy little things licks and, and spins and chords to courses and songs that I already knew. And this is all I can tell you that happened at that point. I got desire. Probably for the first time in my life, I'm like, I want to do that. Have I arrived? No. I'm going to need eternity to learn jazz theory, and I'm planning on doing that in heaven one day. <laughs> but I got desire, and it pushed me into becoming a piano player. In fact, Every time my dad would bring somebody in and they might play piano or whatever, I always would sit down with them and say, can you teach me something that you're, that, you're, that you're playing there? Like that little thing, can you show me how that worked? And desire made all the difference. And now I'm saying about your walk with God, maybe that needs to get, be, become a part of the picture. Maybe you need to imagine and you were even ask the Holy Spirit, what would it look like if I was learning to walk with you day by day and walking in step with the Spirit? What would that look like? What would that look like in my marriage? What would that look like in my business? What would that look like in my, my relationship with my kids or my relationship with my parents? What would that look like in my school? And um, the Lord gave me a picture of this. And it was, it, it, was, it was in three verses. In fact, I felt like he was saying, and I'm going I'm to close with this and talk more about it next week. I felt like he was saying, Tony, if you learn to walk with me, you're going to experience zero G in your life. And I'm like, what does zero G mean? Because I just watched this, I just read a space book and I like space kind of spacey kind of movies. And he was like, exactly what you envision it to be like if you were in outer space, where just a little tiny bit of fuel would start to move you that easy. He said, what if I told you that when you don't walk with me at the, the core and the center of your universe, that it's actually like you're walking in 4G instead of in zero gravity? I started to think that is very attractive because how many, how many of you know that sometimes it just feels like it's just so much work. Life is just so much work. It's just so much work. It's just so much work. And he's like, what if I told you that I'm going to invite you into a place of zero G 
where very little bit of effort will actually move you far, where one seed planted multiplies itself 30, 60, and 100-fold, where you see fruitfulness in every area and piece of your life. What if I'm saying that, Tony, if you learn how to walk this out and you learn to let me be the center of your universe and you orbit around me, that that kind of system is how you were designed to live, and that's zero G. But when anything else takes the center and the core, be it work, be it family, be it anything else, that you weren't created to live that way and you're going to start to be in 4G. What I mean by 4G is four, gravity times 4. Earth is 1G. I flew with a pilot one time and he put the plane into 3G. But God's like, if you don't put me in the center and you live something else as the center of your world, everything's going to feel like 4G. That's what I'm talking about by a picture. That's God getting on the piano and saying, hey, I know you don't like piano, but listen to this. It's kind of a jazz scale. And desire, when properly conceived and envisioned, will give you all the, all the umph that you need to be self-disciplined in life as you pursue Jesus. Okay, here we go. We're done. Um, okay, let's stand together. I'm gonna, but, don't, but don't leave. Don't leave yet. We're not done. Let's just stand together, though, and, and um, I want you just to go into like a quiet space before God. Just simply open to him here, okay? Just open to, open to him right now. We find that God loves to speak to us, and so we're just going to kind of give him an opportunity to do that. And sometimes he'll just bring a thought back, and sometimes he'll, he'll, re, he'll remind you of something that was said. And we just want to just kind of sit there for a second. Yeah, that's good, Tiana. My question was going to be about discipline, you know, and, and where is the Lord inviting us into self-discipline? And I feel like many of us in the room already feel that and know that this is part of the way forward and that the Lord is inviting us to put our hand to the plow, is inviting us to be, is to inviting us into those practices but I don't feel like that's the question he wants to pitch here. I feel like the question is more about desire. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. That's the passage in Psalm 34. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Do you know that we've often misread that and we've thought that when I delight myself in God, he will give me the desires that I have? But the way I actually believe it's intended to be read is when you delight yourself in God, He actually will give you, He will give you the desires that you feel in your heart. It's a little bit of a different way of looking at it. But He actually gives you a vision. He actually implants in you desire and dreams. Now, this is, a, this is what I'm, I'm going to ask Jesus this question and He may say something to you about it. But it's this, okay? Just, just be ready to hear God, what is your desire for me right now? You know, as, you, as we kind of look into the future and we look at, you know, like I, I can look at Ember and I have a desire in my heart for her and my desire for her is that she experiences something that her mom experienced. And, and she experiences the joy of learning piano and grows into it in a mature fashion and it's, I can see her playing in front of crowds one day. I know you have the same desires for us. God, for each person in the room, when you look at us as your son or daughter, what is the desire that you have for us? Would you speak it plainly? Would you give us a picture? What is the desire that you have for me? What is the dream that you have over my life? What is the future that you envision over my life? What does zero G look like in my life? What do you want to launch me into?
Maybe you received something there, just hold on to it. If you didn't, it's totally cool. Sometimes we have to sit on this and just meditate into it. And you might want to give God some time today where you just go, okay, what's your desire for my life? Be specific. What's your desire for my marriage? What's your desire for my work? What's your desire for the calling that you've put on me? What's your desire for relationship with me? What does that look like? And maybe that's the first question before we talk about discipline and self-discipline. Maybe you need to see a picture of Nick on the piano playing jazz to go, oh my goodness, God, you want me to go there? Oh, okay. I have new motivation here. Jesus, thank you for how, you're, how, you, how you speak. And I, I would pray, God, that as we close this time together, that God, you would take whatever you want from what I've said or the worship time or even just interactions together. Things that you've been saying to us, I pray that they would find root in us. Pray that things that are not important would just fall to the background. We want to have a laser focus here on what you're saying. And so God, I pray that whatever you've been saying to us today would be the things we talk about, maybe on the drive home, over lunch this afternoon, or Thanksgiving dinner tomorrow, that we'd be like, okay, this is what I was sensing. What do you think? Yeah. Thank you, God, for the vision that you have for our lives. You just have such a good vision for our lives. And um, I love the way Paul put it, beyond anything we could ask, think, or imagine, is the things that God has in his heart for those who love him, right? They're stored up in his heart the purpose and plan that he has for our lives, the, the calling that he's inviting us into in our lives, so beyond anything we could ever conjure up. It's beautiful, it's amazing, it's exciting, and um, it's good. Thank you, Jesus. Pray your blessing on every person here. God, let your face shine upon us. Be merciful to us in everything we do. Um, let your grace pursue us and your goodness chase after us. In Jesus' name I, I pray. Come on, everybody say it, come on. Amen. Boom. Whew. Have an awesome afternoon. Though you don't need to rush out of here, be blessed, everybody. <laughs>